Hello everyone and welcome to the final topic in Belmont's Math and Science Lecture Series on Math 1010 Quantitative Literacy. I am your host Brandon Stevens and here today we finally get to talk about one of my favorite subjects of this course which is logic. Now, logic is such a broad term and it's used in a variety of different contexts throughout society. So I'm sure when I say logic, you probably have a lot of things that are coming uh, in your mind. But mathematically, we define logic in a very particular way. So several of the goals of mathematics um, are to be able to take a broad categorization of things and break it down to its minute building blocks and see if we can recreate basically a broad spectrum of things just based off of those building blocks. Figure out what is really important in logic and then build it back up. Um, this um, symbolic logic that we're gonna talk about is also a useful way of just codifying uh, different arguments in a way that we can apply it to a variety of circumstances um, and not have very specific cases for each individual argument. Um, in a sense, what mathematical logic really looks at is the structure of arguments, not necessarily what the arguments are saying themselves. Because if the structure of an argument is wrong, it doesn't matter what you're actually saying, the argument just doesn't work. Um, and there are various ways in society, various um, examples, where the structure behind an argument's creates fallacies, and we want to be able to be able to pick out those fallacies when we see them, and also be able to structure our arguments in such a way to where we negate those fallacies, or where we try, where we can avoid them. And so that's really where we're coming at with this idea of symbolic logic. And so we're going to be taking the words and all of the fluff and we're going to kind of throw those to the side. We're going to take statements and represent them with letters, with variables, if you want to go in that kind of context. So like P could represent a whole statement like, I have a dog. Um, and it kind of gets rid of all the fluff there and we just call it P. Now, another thing that we have to deal with in symbolic logic is there is no middle ground. It's very black and white. We have either a statement is true or a statement is false. There is no um, kind of middle ground there. Um, there is actually a further uh, topic in logic called fuzzy logic where you kind of get those probabilities and those middle grounds in there. Um, but for this class, we're going to focus on just if it's true or if it is false. So let's get started. So I mentioned earlier how we are trying to find what the smallest building blocks are and build up from them. And so there are five kind of keywords that we look for when we're trying to put statements together. So one of them is the and statement, the and conjunction. So like, I have a dog and I have a cat. That's a way of forming a compound statement. So what I've got here is a little chart um, that we are going to be calling a truth table. So the way that we're going to set this up um, is first we have to determine how many rows we're going to have. So a quick way to remember how many rows we have is to count the number of statements and we take two to that power. So here we're going to have two statements, P and Q. I have a dog, I have a cat. So two squared is four. If we had an R statement, then we'd have two to the third power, or two times two times two, which is eight rows. So now when we set up our truth table, we know we're going to have four rows. So I start with the one furthest to the right, the, state, the lone statement that is furthest to the right, so Q in this case and I just alternate true-false until I get to four statements. So true-false, true-false. Then I go left one, and I basically double it. So I've got true-true, false, false. 
And that's going to be how, if you only have two statements, just P and Q, that's what it's going to look like every single time. True, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. If you had an R statement, then R would be true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false, and then true, 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 false, 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 false. We'll look at an example later uh, in this video, or we'll probably have to split this into a couple of videos. But now we get this. So P, and then you get like this carrot thing and Q. This carrot thing, when it's pointing up, means and. So P and Q. So I have a dog and I have a cat. The first is true, the second is true, the overall statement is also true. If I have a dog but I don't have a cat, then the and statement is false. I lied to you. I do not have both of them. Uh, and that also is this case if I don't have a dog or if I don't have both of them. So we have true, false, false, and false. That is our general statement for any time we have an and statement, regardless of what P and Q actually mean. So that's our first type. Now we jump over to the or statement. And there is a very specific type of or we use here. It's called the inclusive or. So in this case, it can be P or Q or both of them. We don't exclude the point where we have both. So if it's I have a dog or I had a cat, create this. I have a dog or I have a cat. If I have both of them, the overall statement is still true. I have a dog. I also have a cat. So the or statement works there. I have a dog, but I don't have a cat. So the or statement is still true because I have at least one of them. Uh, and the same goes here. And then false or false is going to be false in the end because neither of the statements we said were true. Now we've got the not conjunction. So that basically will switch the truth value of our statement. So if our statement is true, not that statement would be false. So if the original statement is true, then our not statement, or if our first statement is false, sorry, our not statement would be true. So if I have a dog is the statement, I don't have a dog, that's not not true, <laughs> so it'd be false. If I don't have a dog, then the statement I don't have a dog is true. That's what I'm saying. Now we get into the if-then statement, also known as the conditional. And we're going to look at that um, closer, uh, probably in the following. Um, because it can get a little complicated and there's different forms that we can look at. Um, but that's basically like saying, if you get an A on this test, then I will give you an A in this class. It's a, you have a first part of the statement and that, whatever the result of that is, has an effect on the latter part of the statement. So, again, set it up just as before. True, true, false, false. True, false, true, false. Always set up your truth tables like that. Cannot stress it enough. So if P then Q. So let me actually write that statement because that statement um, is going to be pretty important. So if you get an A on the test, you will get an A That is our if-then statement. So our P is you get an A on this test. Our Q, you'll get an A for the course. I should say then you. Yeah. So if you got an A on the test and you got an A in the course, then that statement is definitely true. What I said was not a lie. If you did work hard and you got an A on this test and I still fail you in the course, what I said was a lie. It was a broken promise. And so our if-then statement is false in that case. If you didn't really try hard and you get a C on the test, then it doesn't matter what I give you. Because I only promise you an A if you got an A on the test. 
So that statement is what we call vacuously true because you didn't do the first part of the statement. And that's actually true for the final one too. False implies false. So you didn't get that on the test to it. Your grade is up in the air. It is true just because it is. It has really no relevance to what I actually promised you. Now, oops, hit it with my back. The last building block we're going to look at is called the biconditional statement. It's the if and only if. Um, and you'll see it has arrows. Let me draw that again. That no, that's weird. It's got arrows going in both directions. So P, if P then Q, and if Q then P. And it's going to look similar, but true implies true is going to be true. False implies false is going to be true. True implies false is false because of this direction. False true, remember this is both if and if then statements. So Q implies P would be false. So that is how an if and only if statement, a biconditional statement, would work out. Okay, so there's the building blocks. Um, and now we're going to look at the conditional statement a little closer, and then we're going to look at more complex truth tables, trying to put more of these building blocks really together. So, two more.